It's my pleasure tonight to be able to introduce uh, Professor Russell Reno, Rusty R. Reno. He's a man, many, a man of many talents, a teacher, scholar, public intellectual, and now editor of a major journal that many of us here in this room read with great interest. Professor Reno was educated at Haverford College and did, did, then did his PhD work at Yale. He taught at Creighton University in Omaha for nearly 20 years. In, in 2010, he took an academic leave from Creighton to assume the editorship of First Things magazine. During his time at Creighton, he became general editor of the Brazos Theological Commentary on the Bible, which some of you may know and refer to, a 40-volume series that's currently in production and which features authors including Yaroslav Pelikan, Stanley Hauerwas, and our own David Lyle Jeffrey. Uh, Professor Reno is actually himself the author of the volume on Genesis in this series, which I just saw outside on the table, which you could go and purchase. In addition to his academic theological work, uh, Professor Reno has also written and edited a number of other books, as well as many articles on topics that deal with various aspects of Christianity, literature, philosophy, and the moral life generally. As editor of First Things, each month he now writes The Public Square, which is an always informative and sometimes provocative introduction to the magazine, probably the first thing many of us read when we open up our new issue. What emerges in his contributions to First Things, as well in the many other essays he has written over the years, is that Professor Reno is intensely interested in the personal dimension of ideas, the lived experience out of which these ideas emerge. Far from being some sort of dry intellectual historian, he writes in a way that is personal and engaging. He does not forget, as the academic world sometimes encourages us to do, that there ought to be a connection between what we study and how we live. Along these lines, Professor Reno has written a wonderful little book of essays, which came out last year and which I commend to all of you. It's also on the table I see out there. It's a yellow book called Fighting the Noonday Devil and Other Essays Personal and Theological. It's a great read. Throughout the book, he consistently comes back to a notion that is expressed nicely in the book's introduction, and I'll quote from him here. He says, the web of life is, constitution, excuse me, is constituted by relations between real people and real events. He continues, the concrete particularity of life shimmers with the power of reality, a power that always overflows and floods our concepts with more than we can theorize. This is especially true of the recalcitrant and irritating seductive and captivating uniqueness of human personality. And I have a feeling that Professor Reno's talk this evening will touch on topics of this kind, as you will perhaps have seen from the title of his presentation, Face to Face in the Information Age. Let's give him a warm welcome. Well, I'd like to thank uh, Elizabeth Corey for that very kind introduction and to uh, Darren Davis for uh, inviting me to, to come here to Baylor. Uh, um, I actually can be kind of dry sometimes. Uh, Robert Wilkins said that uh, when it comes to after dinner speeches, I need to work in more jokes. Um, and, uh, but I've, 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 I've failed to do that this evening. So uh, you'll, have to endure, um, you'll have to endure maybe overly serious ideas. Um, and I'm really happy to be here back at Baylor uh, University. Um, I mean, Baylor is a very important um, institution for Christians throughout America, uh, globally, I think. Um, one, of the, one of the common views that is held, has been held for 200 or more years is that uh, Christian faith is not compatible with full participation in the modern world. And I think uh, Baylor's commitment to uh, being um, uh, an excellent university that can, makes uh, basic contributions in the sciences and in other academic subjects, and at the same time um, being a, a committed Christian institution is just a very important witness for, for, for all of us um, in this time. So, uh, so again, thanks for, for having me here at this uh, wonderful university. Um, Elizabeth was right. I am going to touch on some of the same themes uh, that I've, um, one of the things I always tell graduate students about when they're working on their various projects, you better make sure it's a good idea because it's the only one you're going to get. Uh, you tend to say the same thing over and over again um, when, you're, when you're an academic. Uh, so 
Now, um, I'm going to make as my topic tonight, uh, you know, the old line about writers, you're supposed to write about what you know. And so I know about, uh, I know very little about information technology in a, in a technological sense. Um, and, but what I do know about is higher education, having spent 20 years as a professor at Creighton University. So I want to talk about the information age, but I want to talk about it specifically with reference to higher education. Now, during my years as a college professor, uh, I heard a great deal about how information technology is going to transform higher education. Now, the claims went something like this. Some would say, the World Wide Web puts tremendous new resources at our fingertips, allowing for dramatic improvements in student learning. Or people would say, the web connects people, and for the first time, education can become truly global. Or others would say, master teachers with technology can transmit their lectures to an extended virtual classroom, expanding the influence of excellence. Or others would say, online courses will make higher education more accessible and uh, to, uh, available to a wider, more diverse range of people. And this will mean that more will be able to benefit from higher education. Now, when I heard these claims back then as a professor, I was skeptical. And to be honest, I remain so today. I don't see any evidence that the Google search engine has made students more informed. Instead of going to the library students, and for that matter, professors, and sometimes magazine editors, go to Wikipedia. And the upshot is not an expansion of much of, of anything, but instead often a contraction. Information technology tends to transform information into a deliverable commodity. And we become passive consumers of information instead of, uh, instead of active learners. So instead of bright new possibilities, I fear that academia is involving, evolving towards a cut and paste culture. But I'm getting ahead of myself with my criticisms. Um, I also heard, so I'm going to come back to, to these questions uh, later, but I also heard from administrators that a dramatic expansion of web-based education is inevitable. And two reasons are usually given. The first tends to be asserted as self-evident fact. So I hear people say that young people today prefer, prefer virtual interaction. And so they're going to demand a transition from face-to-face -face classrooms to electronic chat rooms. Now the second is more likely to be whispered between those who need to allocate resources and balance budgets. And it goes something like this. We're going to move to virtual classrooms, not because they achieve any particularly noble educational goals, but because they promise to bring in more tuition money at a lower cost. So two basic arguments. Now, unlike the supposed, the claims for the supposed benefits of virtual education, I find these two suppositions entirely plausible. That is to say, consumer demand and budgetary pressure. They make it very likely that we'll see a great deal of pressure to migrate away from many dimensions of teaching and learning to web-based modes of communication and interaction. What I want to do this evening is to outline a rationale for resistance. I will advocate a view of education that turns on personal encounter, face-to-face, -face, my title. This view does not require us to smash the machines, but we will need to exercise prudent judgment in our use of information technology in higher education. And we need to be honest. If the virtual classroom is really about satisfying consumer, edu the educational consumer and saving money, let's not deceive ourselves by imagining that it does not debase and degrade our best traditions of face-to-face -face pedagogy. So my thesis for tonight, to uh, offer that uh, web-based education degrades uh, the, our best traditions of face-to-face -face pedagogy. Now, we use the term technology to denote the application of modern science to the age-old human effort to gain a margin of control over natural powers and potencies in order to make them serve our ends. In the ancient world, for example, horse breeders developed the practical skill 
the techne in the Greek, the techne of managing the animals so that they would mate in such a way that desirable traits would predominate. Embryology and other reproductive technologies provide the horse breeder with much more powerful tools for achieving what is essentially the same goal. Now the same holds for information technology. In the ancient world, there was an exacting skill or techne for memorization of long poems like the Iliad. The invention of a written language marked a tremendous advance in this techne, allowing more information to be preserved as well as ensuring greater accuracy. Alongside this innovation came new storage technologies, the most remarkable and transformative of which was the invention of the codex or the bound book. One time I was at, uh, my wife is Jewish, and I was at, uh, in grad school, I was at synagogue with her, and uh, they only had one Torah scroll, and they had read from something in Deuteronomy for a special festival a couple of days before, but the regular uh, pattern of reading required the reading to be in about the middle of Genesis. And it took about 15 minutes to scroll from Deuteronomy to Genesis. And you think about, the, uh, if you open up your Bibles, it takes uh, less than a second to get from Deuteronomy to Genesis. Quite a striking advance in information technology, the invention of the codex or the bound book. Also, it helped me understand why uh, rabbinic um, thinking involves so much kind of associative reflection because you have to, memorization becomes very, very important when you have only have a scroll to work with. Um, it is in many ways still unsurpassed, the codex, I would argue. But we now also have uh, electronic forms of information storage and transmission, things like search engines and so social media sites and much, much more. And these, these technologies uh, continue to refine and advance the techne that began when some unknown bard figured out how to use rhymes and other verbal cues in order to bundle phrases and lines together into larger units that could be reliably stored in his memory. It's basic continuity there between these uh, techniques of memorization uh, and uh, 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 YouTube, a lot of a lot basic continuity. Now in his probing essay uh, on the question concerning technology, the German philosopher Martin Heidegger helps us understand the deep and continuing meaning of technology. And he describes it as a placing or holding of reality in reserve. A placing or holding in reserve. Now in the nature of things, people talk and horses mate. You know, this continuous flow of things. And in a very real sense, technology interrupts the flow. In the case of the horse breeder, interrupting the flow of DNA variation. The horse breeder puts the mare into a pen, holding her in reserve so that he can control which stud she mates with. So also the ancient bard, he holds the poem in reserve in his memory so that he can call it forth at the annual festival, bringing delight to the gathered community. Now Heidegger was deeply concerned about the implications of technology, and this idea, this, this, this holding in reserve. By his way of thinking, and here I, I have to issue that sort of warning that I'm not a Heidegger scholar, and this is a simplistic, uh, et cetera, caveat, caveat, caveat. That was the collagen professor and me talking. Now the magazine editor and me is just going to go forward and talk about it. By his way of thinking, being, that's the capital B, being, or truth, I prefer to use the word truth, is a shining forth rather than a holding in reserve. Truth comes out of the darkness of things and arrests us. As he writes in one of his characteristic passages, quote, before, man, before he speaks, man must first let himself be claimed again by, by being. Be claimed, uh, be arrested. For this reason, Heidegger defines serious thinking as a kind of active waiting, a clearing away that prepares us for the shining forth of truth. Now, I don't ascribe to Heidegger's view that the entire history of philosophy in the West marks a primal fall into what he calls the forgetfulness of being. Nor do I agree with him that metaphysics, is a, as traditionally understood, functions as a kind of grand 
intellectual technology. And I'm definitely not in favor of the obscure and Vatic style of his later work. But I think he's right about the need to be claimed by being, to be subjected to or under the thumb of truth. In Plato's dialogues, Socrates consistently uses arguments to clear away errors, but he does not ascend to insight by way of syllogisms. On the contrary, sometimes the dialectic ends in puzzlement, which serves not as a refutation or defeat of reason in the Platonic dialogues, but as a stilling of its active quest. And precisely this stillness in the dialogues often encourages the receptivity that allows our apprehension of the truth, which in Plato's dialogues often speaks in and through the idiom of myth. Now, by my reckoning, something similar happens in modern science, although by way of very different methods. When Newton invented calculus, he did not take possession of the elliptical orbits of the planets. On the contrary, the mathematics allowed the luminous truth of things to shine forth and arrest him. The same holds for ex the experimental method broadly understood. Most, most experiments actually yield very little. Instead, a lifetime of work in the lab seems to me best understood as an ongoing effort to maneuver one's mind into, into position to see what has never been seen before. In this sense, modern science is in many ways a perfect instance of active waiting. Now, it would be wrong to imagine that Heidegger opposed technology. It's a fact about our humanity, as he recognized. Moreover, it can serve to enhance the shining forth of being. For example, the ancient bard, with his techne of memorization, brings delight with his feats of mem when his feats of memory allow him to recite the Iliad or some other poem or discourse. Nonetheless, Heidegger sees technology as a danger. The problem is not that nuclear weapons can destroy the world or that we face great difficulties because of global warming. According to Heidegger, the danger of technology comes from the fact that, insofar as we are technological, we'll orient our intellects towards the task of storing up and holding in reserve, rather than preparing ourselves to be arrested by truth. Now, I want to apologize for my digression into Heidegger, which is not always uh, funny. It doesn't always illuminate the way that he, he hopes being to illuminate. But, but for me, I find his work has been helpful to think through, in a basic way, the relationship between technology and truth-seeking. With some of these concepts and reflections in mind, I want to work my way back toward my reasons for resisting virtual education. Now, information technology holds words, ideas, facts, formulae, conversations, performances, and many other artifacts of human mental activity. It holds them in reserve, literally. That's what makes it so useful. I, I can't consider everything at once, and so I take notes uh, when I'm reading a book or when I listen to a lecture so that I can refer to them later. I can't learn everything from scratch, and thankfully, I can consult a dictionary, an encyclopedia, or reference books, all of which are now greatly expanded and more accessible on the web. They're both holding in reserve. I hold the ideas in reserve. I hold the information in reserve. Or our culture holds it in reserve for me. Even think about professors putting books on reserve in the library back in the old days. Um, so the actual terminology is part of the way we think about information and education. Now, all this is necessary. We can't have a tradition of music, for example, without some way to store and transmit musical scores. And the same holds for poetry, science, and every other consequential human activity. And this is especially the case for education, because we need to have ways to hold things in reserve so that we can come back to them to reflect, to analyze, and to assess. Now, for students, this is obvious. Good lectures are always a pleasure to listen to. Uh, maybe tonight's not so great, but, uh, but the good ones are a pleasure to listen to. And conversations let us test out our ideas, good things. But words spoken face to face
flow by very quickly. Moreover, they're, in er they're invariably colored by warmth and conviction and, so, uh, and the mental, emotional atmosphere created by the speaker. There's an electricity in face-to-face -face encounter, an emotional atmosphere that affects how we hear an argument or a presentation. Uh, and holding words in reserve, holding the lecture in reserve or holding the conversation in reserve allows us to review the ideas more carefully, more coolly, more objectively. That's why we have outlines and textbooks and other methods of instruction. The same holds for assignments. On some rare occasions, students are subjected to oral examination. However, for the most part, assignments and exams are written. They are, by writing down, they are held in reserve. They are held in reserve outside the flow of conversation. This allows the professor to assess more carefully. And in this way, and in many others, information technology allows for greater accuracy and more sophisticated modes of analysis, which is why it has always contributed to the development of intellectual sophistication and plays an integral role in any culture. However, therein it seems to me lies the danger. Factual accuracy and cogent argument may be necessary for the life of the mind, but they are not sufficient. The mind is part of the soul, and in order to make it a reliable organ of truth, it needs to be habituated and formed. Thus, as uh, a great Dominican scholar, uh, Sertelange, I think uh, Darren Davis made reference to Sertelange in his uh, uh, wonderful remarks at the worship service this afternoon, as he, made, he makes this particularly clear. Although he uses different terminology, he sees our relation to truth along the same lines as Heidegger. He writes, we must give ourselves from the heart if truth is to give herself to us. But we are corrupted by sin, and this self-giving does not come automatically. Therefore, as Sir Delarge recognizes, a fundamental, there is a fundamental moral dimension to the life of the mind. So as he writes, truth visits those who love her, who surrender to her, and this love cannot be without virtue. Purity of thought, he says elsewhere, requires purity of soul. Now most of us intuitively recognize the need for something more than information and academic skill. We're familiar with the sort of person who has the amazing ability to memorize material. He has read all of Shakespeare's plays, for example, and can quote chapter and verse. And yet, his interpretations are mechanical and formulaic, or perhaps fanciful and idiosyncratic. Because accurate and detailed knowledge is such an important part of the academic world, as well as analytical skill, one often finds professors of this type, the type of this student who's, who has a remarkable ability to manipulate Shakespeare's plays in conversation. Some work narrowly within their fields in cough dust, while others love their own inventiveness without regard to the scholarly consensus. They are very well informed. Many have, are very adept at argument and possess great logical skills but they are not reliable. When we're working on a project, for example, we don't consult with them or ask for their guidance because we don't trust their judgment, which is another way of saying that we do not think they have trustworthy intellectual habits. They have knowledge, but they lack the virtue of knowledge. Now in his lectures on the idea of a university, John Henry Newman identifies the virtue of knowledge, rather than knowledge in and of itself, the virtue of knowledge as the great goal of the university. Which he, rec and he recognizes that this virtue of knowledge uh, is formed far more by way of personal influence than by the ingestion of a circumscribed body of information. Here's what he says about the virtue of knowledge. Quote, it, it is an acquired illumination. It is a habit, a personal possession, an inward endowment, end quote. 
we can be instructed in all sorts of ways that give us command over academic material. But by his way of thinking, education, and this is, these are his words, implies an action upon our mental nature and the formation of a character. It is something individual and is commonly spoken of in connection with religion and virtue." End quote. So the essence of pedagogy for Newman involves leading students towards a sensibility or even a way of life. And Newman is so determined to make this point that he comes close to asserting the irrelevance in the idea of university, he comes close to asserting the irrelevance of a curriculum and classroom teaching, arguing instead that the deepest educator of the young is a living tradition or a genus loci of a college or any other self-perpetuating student culture. It is, to use his terminology, he calls it an ethical atmosphere. And it, that's what does most of the work of education, perhaps the most important work. Now, as many have pointed out, and incorrectly, I think, Newman's effusions about the genus Loki reflect an idealistic rather than accurate picture of the typical 19th century Oxford colleges of his youth. But I think his basic claim is clear and persuasive, and that is that education is essentially personal and our minds are most deeply and profoundly and reliably formed in face-to-face -face encounters. As he put it in one of his early sermons, truth is felt most strongly through personal influence. Arguments, analysis, and evidence, these are the, this is the very stuff of instruction. And we, rightly, we, right, we will rightly focus on working our way through assigned material in accurate, responsible, and sophisticated ways. And information technology can help us do that. But all this work takes, us in a, takes on a very different significance when intermixed with the power of personality. We are shaped as much by our respect, or sadly, by our lack of respect for our teachers, or uh, with our friendships with, or antipathy to our peers, or by our loyalty to, or in some cases, alienation from our institutions. We're as much shaped by that as by any discipline or body of knowledge. And it's this formation, for good or ill, that stamps our intellectual character in deep, deep ways. I think this is the essential insight that Newman brings to bear on education, that it's fundamentally a, uh, that at the deepest level, it's a face-to-face -face encounter. Now, the virtual classroom and the virtual university deracinate higher education. It's obvious that an entirely virtual university has no genus loci because it has no location. And the loss is significant, as the behavior of professors and people like me indicates very clearly. And I sort of digress into what professors do that, that shows that they don't believe in, in the, the uh, potential of the virtual university. We're not satisfied, we professor types, with virtual collaboration. But we are forever flying around to go to conferences like this one. We know that it's not just or even primarily about giving or listening to papers. Uh, I, I hate to think mine's so worthless, but, but it's the fa a fact. Which these papers, which we could listen to papers much more efficiently by the way of a virtual conference. The main engine of the scholarly life is found in the ongoing conversations one has with friends and co-conspirators. You don't just exchange information or ideas at these conferences, though that's important. Over drinks, oh, did I say that? Over, <laughs> over Dr. Pepper floats, you brag and gripe. You give encouragement and you listen to criticism that you can only hear from a graduate stu student friend whose personal loyalty you trust. It's only face to face that we take the measure of others and let them take our measure. All of which is fundamentally important if we're to sort out for ourselves whose judgment is to be trusted and how we're to form our own. Now, as important as these few days at faraway hotels can be, their small beer 
Did I say that? They're small cokes as compared with the rich and multi, I think the euphemism small beer is okay. It, they're small beer as compared to the rich and multifaceted community of college campuses. For 20 years I taught at Creighton University in Omaha, Nebraska, and I had, faced, I had to face my students, and I had to face my colleagues. And that forced me to take responsibility for my ideas. To be frank, when I was a young faculty member, I would have preferred to skim along the surfaces with informed reports about this or that, what this or that scholar said about Thomas Aquinas or St. Augustine or Karl Barth and something like some other topic, which is basically what I did as a graduate student. But the looks of incomprehension in the eyes of my students forced me to set aside my scholarly props. I had to find plain words to explain basic concepts. And the ongoing and regular face-to-face -face encounter of the classroom, of classroom teaching, really, it, to put it, you know, kind of colloquially, it invaded my personal space in a big way. The personalities of my students put pressure on me that was very hard to avoid. It was painful, but it was fruitful, which is why face-to-face -face education plays such an important role in any living culture. In fact, I was thinking about it the other day that the face-to-face -face classroom is probably the, the, along with various religious rituals, uh, the oldest kind of practices, ongoing practices in our culture. The uh, um, face-to-face instruction is uh, an ancient Israelite could go to a seminar room in Baylor and understand what is going on and understand absolutely nothing else about the way we live our lives. But that part, I think the ancient Israelites go, oh, I know what that's all about, face-to-face -face instruction, because that's what the prophets of Israel underwent in their own formation. Now, few actually, few actually imagine really a purely virtual university. Well, that's not true. Well, few, okay, some do though. They see web, but most see web-based courses as supplementing the traditional classroom rather than supplanting it. And this will give students and faculty, they argue, greater flexibility, making education more accessible, more affordable, and less elitist. Now these are by no means ignoble goals, or they would save the university money. These are not ignoble goals. But given human nature, the virtual classroom will degrade an educational culture because the basic function of information technology is to hold things in reserve. And that lets us avoid each other. True, now of course, students in web-based courses, they have to download assignments and upload papers and post comments. Moreover, the teacher has to upload, download, monitor comments, and so forth. There's, a lot, there's, a lot of, there's plenty of activity and interaction. So it's not as though the participants aren't engaged in communication. Good night, of course, it's communication technology. Of course you're engaged in communication. But they do so, for the most part, on their own schedules, in accord with their own needs, and almost entirely in their own self-chosen environments. So they engage in communication, but primarily on their own terms. Uh, I mean, which is the whole value of a lot of information technology is we can, we can engage in communication on our own terms, just like the horse breeder can, breed the, can use the sexual instincts of horses for his own purposes, on his own terms, um, and so on. And I think we have to recognize that this convenience or the ability to use communication on our own terms is tempting. So for example, in places like New York where I live, it's very difficult to afford housing on a faculty salary, believe me. As a consequence, young professors tend to live in faraway suburbs where the prices are lower. And there's a natural impulse to try to migrate to modes of teaching that let you commute fewer days of the week. It's just human nature. And the same thing goes for students for that matter. But there are in fact deeper and more fundamental temptations at work here as well. It can be painful to feel the pressure of another person's personality. I've certainly sent emails rather than picking up the phone, not because it's convenient, but because it's so much less emotionally difficult to do so. Or I've called when I should have given the news to someone in person. And anyone who's been fired by email knows exactly what's going on. The information technology allows the boss to maintain his distance and to avoid difficult painful personal encounters. It's basically what, how the information technology is being used. 
So we often think of college as kind of a golden time. But academic life also involves difficult personal situations and painful encounters. As any teacher knows, students often don't want to be influenced or formed. They want to get a good grade and get on with their lives. Moreover, teachers don't like to be challenged. They don't like to be caught unprepared. And we certainly don't like to face our students when we have to give them a failing grade. The same holds for the, same holds for the ongoing culture of any school. Professors, I can t t testify by personal testimony, we professors often tire of the constant friction we feel when, when we differ with our colleagues. That's one reason why professors don't spend much time in their offices. As the success of social media indicates, most of us want to hang out with like-minded people who we can turn on and off as we wish. Now, information technology does not, facilitate, does not facilitate communication, or if it does facilitate communication, it does so because it holds information in reserve. It facilitates a deracinated form of communication that allows us to interact at a distance and at our own convenience. Both of these features are part of the appeal of the virtual classroom, uh, you know, at our own convenience. That's how you can get more students to enroll at Baylor who, because of their work schedules and so forth, can't otherwise enroll. So it's because it's more convenient for them. They can, that's what it means to be able to fit things into your schedules, more convenient. Uh, and at a distance, obviously. But both of these features, which explain part of the appeal of the virtual classroom, are also undermine the full potential of education, for they allow us to evade the personal encounters that are inconvenient and difficult, encounters that most of us need to endure if we're to overcome our native laziness and our self-regard, both of which prevent us from developing the virtue of knowledge. So I'm going to end kind of on a personal note to sort of dr try to dramatize for you the way in which uh, we need personal encounter. Uh, we, need to be, we need to be educated with people we cannot avoid in order to get the full benefit of education. So I went to Haverford College, as Elizabeth Corey mentioned. It's a small place and it has a very strong genus Loki. Not always one, I, not one I'm terribly congenial to as a kind of conservative Christian at the present, but it has a very strong one. And this strength of this, the, 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 the force of the place was especially true for me because my father went there, as did my sister for a time, and my brother as well. And my freshman English teacher was Jack Lester. He was also a graduate of Haverford College and had taught at the college for more than 30 years. He knew my father and had been the college roommate of the best, and the best friend of the father of my childhood babysitter. Now, if that sounds complicated, let me tell you that it was exactly these sorts of complications that were typical of my deep, pre-existing, and personal entanglements with the people at Haverford College. To be honest, I often tired of the personality of the place, feeling it too close and too familiar. And I actually fled on a couple of occasions, once to the oil rigs of Wyoming, and another time to big, anonymous Columbia University in the even bigger and more anonymous New York City where I could live my life on my own terms. But it was Haverford in the end that influenced me the most. Two or three weeks into my freshman year, I wrote my first paper for Jack Lester. And I toiled and I struggled and I turned it in. I mildly despaired. A math and physics major at the time, writing was not my strong suit. Moreover, rather than going to college after high school, I had spent a year in Yosemite Valley as a climbing bum. And at the beginning of the year, my freshman year, I had, a, I had actually a very hard time folding myself back into the disciplines of regular schoolwork, as you can probably imagine. Now, a few days later, we had our very first tutorial. And Jack Lester gave me back my paper with his comments, written in his exquisite cursive handwriting. My grade was a D, and the last line was devastating. It said, it seems you're still climbing rocks. <laughs> Now I sat in silence in, my, in, his, in his office, anguished by the cutting knife of criticism, which is all the sharper for being so true and so personal. He gave me a wry smile. <laughs> he was good at that. 
and made no mention of the comment and told me that he was sure I was capable of better. I could feel the tectonic plates of my soul shifting. I think if I look back, it was one of the defining moments of my life. Now, when people talk about the virtual classroom, I don't know whether to laugh or to cry. Information technology is holding reality in reserve, taking it out of the living flow of personal relations. As a freshman who was equal parts insecurity and cockiness, if a teacher had sent me that criticism in an email or a text message, I would almost certainly have uttered an angry self-defensive expletive and deleted it. This isn't an argument against technology. Jack Lester wrote those words after all. I mean, he used the technology of his fountain pen, uh, which was, he used a fountain pen, and, uh, and he used the technology of writing. He wrote the words, he didn't speak them, but I read them face to face. They spoke to me under the influence of his personality, which of course was in so many ways blended with the larger personality of the college, all of which made at many different levels claims on me. I was in a very real sense strapped to an operating table, which is why the knife of criticism both cut and cured. Now it's painful and sometimes perilous, but finally it's a painful and, uh, and perilous, but nonetheless happy fact that we're vulnerable to others, especially those we can't avoid, parents, children, spouses, of course, but also those that we're bound to by friendship and common loyalty. And this includes the mysterious loyalties that are formed in the classroom. Under the power of personal influence, our damaged egos cannot wriggle away from all those necessary but discomforting moments of exposure, criticism, and expe expectation that are necessary if our lives are to be claimed by something greater than our often silly and superficial self-wills. Now, what's true of life as a whole is true of the life of the mind. That's why a virtual university and a virtual classroom holds out so little promise, however inev inevitable it may be. Newman's idealized view of a residential college and its intimate, often overbearing, common culture reflected his recognition that we need to be subjected to personal pr pressures in order to be intellectually formed. Face to face, we feel the claims of others on our souls, claims all the more powerful when we don't have a choice. That's the genius of the traditional classroom. It's a place where we can't avoid each other. I find it telling that in its basic form, the classroom, as I pointed out, has changed very little over the millennia. That's because the pressing claims of personality prepare us for the essence of knowledge, which is submission to truths that are rarely convenient and rarely pleasing to us. Thank you very much. We do have time for questions. So I'll kick things off. Thank you very much. I'm Todd Buras, philosopher here. Um, I'm ready to join you in the resistance, uh, join, join you on the ramparts. But, but uh, one of the things that occurred to me as you spoke was just how much uh, what you said depends on your view about the aims of education. And for the most part, it seems like even at a university like this, there's some lack of clarity about the aims of education. I think the way you described education, its aim was formation and the mm -hmm. virtue of knowledge. Um, so vast stretches of the educational institution that you're visiting and all of those that it imitates, I think, would not accept that as the aim of education. And I'm curious what you say there. I mean, do you just say, well, look, if you think the aim of education is just to give you some knowledge, you really don't need to be together. Um, if it's just to give you a skill, go ahead and do that from your computer screen. In fact, why do you need a university at all? You just need a library card. Right. No, I think that's a, that's a great question and a great point. Um, and I think that uh, the virtue of knowledge, all disciplines require the virtue of knowledge for the people who are responsible for its, uh, its, its development and transmission. Uh, 
But many people, you know, like if you're a pharmacist, right, um, you may not need the virtue of knowledge, uh, but you do need the skill of knowing what drugs to prescribe and so on. But I think the pharmacy professors need the virtue of knowledge because they're responsible not to do a, a certain task for society, but to, ex to develop and expand and transmit. So they have to have good judgment and they have to know what constitutes a good journal article showing that such and such is actually a better uh, drug therapy. See what I'm saying? So um, uh, there, there, you can imagine accounting, other things, and so on. So I would, I would submit that every discipline taught at Baylor requires practitioners who have the virtue of knowledge. But there are many, um, there are many disciplines that, as a matter of fact, train people who are primarily functioning technically um, in society. And for them, yes, uh, 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 virtual education may be effective cost cutting. But I think we need to be honest though, that's what we're doing. We're basically training technicians. Not right? educating. What? And not we're educating, not educating souls. them in that yeah. robust sense that yeah. Newman envisioned. So was the idea just to make and sure. You're kind of selling somebody short, right? You have somebody 18, 19 years old who talented, motivated, smart, and they, uh, they sign up for the pharmacy program and you have a web-based only education and they never find out that they have a calling to be a pharmacy professor and not just yeah. a pharmacist. Yeah. Um, so I've, that to me would be the argument against being, being just easy cut and dry. Yeah. Some technical people track one direction and everybody else does the traditional classroom. Yeah, yeah. So just to follow up since there's no, no one waiting behind me right, here. Right, uh, follow give me on, a second to think it up. Yeah, um, follow up. Could you, would it, I, I'm not sure I understood what you thought the uh, technical professor needs the virtue of knowledge for. Was it for the sake of, uh, of keeping alive the actual discipline that they are an inheritor and keeper of? Yes, so, also so to expand the discipline. To expand the discipline so, so that um, the virtue of knowledge, I mean, one way to put it is, I guess, maybe a virtual university couldn't sustain the disciplines that are conveyed through the virtual. You could hire people yeah, who, who had who, a real face. They could do the technical training. But I, let me put it this way. If you're a structural engineer, right, you're an engineering professor, your specialty is structural engineering, the virtue of knowledge is what lets you distinguish between, as I said, a good paper, a bad paper, a good argument, a bad yeah, argument, yeah. for why we should change our technical requirements. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that, that Newman saw, and I think he's very persuasive here, that this is, cannot be done by algorithm. Yeah. Uh, you cannot make these kinds of determinations on the, by some sort of uh, pre-known pre formula. It's a, it's a matter of judgment, you know, good intellectual judgment. Um, and we all know people, those of you who are faculty, we all know people who are very brilliant who do not have good judgment, um, like I said. They're, they're easily smitten by these sort of ide fiques or pet ideas or, or you know people who are really brilliant but you suspect that they're more concerned to advance their careers than they are to uh, get it right. Um, uh, so there's all kinds of, that's why when you go to, that's why, that's why professors go to conferences, right? They know intuitively that the virtual exchange of ideas will not let them see what it is that's making other people tick and they can figure out where they fit into uh, what they respect and who they respect. Who, they, who do you respect and where do you fit vis-a-vis -vis the people you respect? It's, uh, it's not something that can be done um, in a virtual way. You find people through email who, who you think are simpatico and then you know, oh, this is the person I want to go meet. Uh, or people you meet you follow up with and sustain your relationships. Um, so again, this is not anti-technology. This is just, let's be realistic about what it is um, that's at the core of uh, what I would call a culture of truth. The face-to-face -face is at the core of the culture of truth. Thank is you. My, is my position. And I'm sticking to it. Um, so uh, this is probably a bit of a tangent, but what do you think the role of research is for good education, I guess? Yeah, I mean, I thought that as a professor, 99.9% uh, .9 of research is pointless in terms of the, div uh, no, that's too strong. Uh, <laughs> most research is not really advancing the discipline. 
what it's doing is, is renewing uh, the faculty member, uh, faculty member's commitment to involvement in um, the discipline. And so it, it, it's, um, it's, it's keeping the faculty member as a living participant in a, in a body of knowledge is how it, so I, I, I think it's actually, it, it, is, it is very important, although in the current climate overrated by, uh, by administrators. Um, in other words, I always used to tell junior faculty to print their CVs on heavy stock paper because the fa uh, administration only weighs them, uh, <laughs> you know? Um, right, nobody makes any judgments about the quality of work. And I, you know, maybe I'm just prideful, but I thought that if I, uh, I don't have, I mean, I can't judge the quality of scientific work or, or mathematical papers, but I think across the social sciences and humanities, if if you give me a course release uh, to do it, I can make uh, judgments about the quality of uh, people's research. Uh, you know, well-formed thesis, uh, you know, so on and so forth. It's, I just don't think it's that I mean, rough, rough. It's not gonna be nuanced, but rough. Uh, and, and so, and also you can tell people who are churning versus people who are who are, for whom the research is a living thing rather than a, a mechanical thing. Um, so I, I think in the current university, I think research is, is, is important and it needs to be both encouraged and rewarded, but I think it needs to be done so in a way that recognizes the way in which uh, um, if, you, if you create reward structures for things, you'll get, you'll get debased forms of it. Um, you know, if you make student evaluations the be all and end all of evaluating teaching, then you're going to get pandering professors. And if you make, you know, numbers of publications the be all and end all of being a professor or rank and tenure, you're gonna get debased research. Um, it's just human nature. Uh, and I think administrators need to, need to just be sensitive to that. Uh, there's no solution to that problem. It's called original sin. <laughs> Uh, thanks for the great paper, Dr. Reno, and uh, thanks for um, helping remind me that my own pedagogical proclivities, even if they're quixotic, are nonetheless wise. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you about uh, making the shift from uh, the face-to-face -face environment t of teaching to the virtual environment, if you will, of uh, editing, uh, because there is a sense in which the book and then ultimately the professional journal are, you know, early forms of distance learning technology. Yes. So I wonder if you could reflect a little bit on your comments about face-to-face -face learning in light of your editing work and maybe the different telos that it's involved in classroom teaching and the, the work of a journal like First Things. I mean, journals and First Things Magazine wants to uh, disseminate ideas, influence people, shape opinion, uh, advance a certain argument, a certain set of arguments. Uh, and the information technology is what makes it accessible. Uh, and you know this is why you know the printing press was important. This is why writing was important. You know when when uh, uh, the students of Epictetus wrote down his sayings into the uh, handbook, uh, they they expanded the scope of influence of his his pedagogy. Um, and so clearly that's what I do as a uh, as an editor. Um, and, but, it, but that's not the same as educating. So I guess I'm making a distinction there. Uh, I think about the, uh, uh, a couple weeks ago I was in St. Louis to give a talk and uh, one of my former student's father found out, saw the advertisement and he, he emailed me, information technology, let, he reached out because he wanted to pick me up at the airport to thank me for the influence I had on his daughter. I don't think that's going to happen with the people that I'm editing. Uh, you know, that's not, if it does happen, I would be worried that they're trying to ingratiate themselves because they want to get published more often in First Things Magazine. But, um, and then I had lunch with a former student who was completing his PhD at, um, at Wash U. And, uh, you know, those are, those are such priceless experiences. Uh, it makes me realize what a, kind of unique vocation teaching is. Uh, and again, I just don't see that guy, I don't see that guy picking me up if I had had his daughter as a virtual student. 
and I don't think the former student who wanted to have lunch with me, we wouldn't have the same kind of uh, warm relation that we have now as really as peers, more, we're peers. I mean, he's a really smart guy, uh, really am amazing guy. Um, we wouldn't have that, I don't think, if I'd had him in a distance learning course. You know, uh, there's always exceptions. You know, I think that, and some people are very gifted writers and they can project their personality into their prose. Um, that's what makes them great writers. Um, and so, you know, you, there are people that you feel like you've met and talked to and that you've only read. Uh, but most of us don't have that gift. And so we're only really present to people face to face. Uh, and and uh, I think that's really um, something to be cherished. It's an elitist view. There's no way that you can have, you know, we already don't have that. I mean, you know, you already have big, massive universities where there's a kind of, there's a kind of attenuated face-to-face -face quality to it. So this is an elitist view, um, or it's an elitist project. Face-to-face -face education is an elitist uh, project. Higher education, face-to-face -face education is, not obviously at the, uh, at the primary and, and secondary level. Does it have to be? I guess it probably does have to be an elitist project because it's so expensive. I had a student who, I, she was very brilliant young woman and she was pre-med and she got A's in my class, I took a couple of my classes, she got A's. And I, I always said, Monique, you know, you just don't have to work very hard, do you? And, and it bugged her that I would say that to her. I didn't, I praised her, I gave her the A, but I wasn't praising her by telling her how wonderful she was. Instead, I was criticizing her for not having to work so hard. So she came to my office and, and, and during her junior year and said, well, you always say I don't have to work very hard. What should I do? And I said, well, there's this program at Oxford. Uh, it's a program in medieval and renaissance studies. I said, well, I'm not really that interested in that. I said, that that's irrelevant. Go to the program and, you know, it's the best, you, you'll, you'll, you'll enjoy it. So she did. And she came back. It was a transformative experience. One-on-one -on -one tutorials. Unbelievable, she said. You know, uh, why don't we do that at Creighton? And I said, because it's incredibly expensive. <laughs> and she went, yeah, I guess I could see that. <laughs> So, so we, we, are, we do have to endure these limitations, and I, I think in my resistance to virtual education, I am not uh, t saying that the administrator who has to make hard choices about how to preserve, about hard choices about uh, how to finance a place like Baylor might make choices that allow for the growth of distance education. But I want those choices to be made about how we need certain resources to sustain or perhaps even deepen the face-to-face -face, uh, component. And let's not kid ourselves. We're doing something, you know, in order to, you know, in the, on my magazine, we sell advertising space. And, and in the best of all possible worlds, we wouldn't have ads in the magazine. Um, but I sell those ads and I sell them happily because they are what provides some of the revenue that lets us publish the magazine. And if that's the way that distance education and virtual education evolve and at places like Baylor, well, that's a, maybe that's a good judgment call of prudent use of resources and, and finding revenue streams to sustain what, what ought to be, what we ought to all agree is uh, an extraordinarily precious thing, uh, which is the genus Loki um, of a place like this, which is only really, which is really the relationships of, of actual people through time. Yes. Um, I actually kind of have two questions, kind of related. Um, you talked about um, virtual education and how it um, does not carry the same way as face-to-face. -face. What about something such as like Skype in the classroom, which Skype is a communication face-to-face. -face. Are you saying that even that um, does not bear the same weight as actually being um, just one-on-one, -on -one. that is a form, it is over a kind of technology, but still that for people who might be removed, might not be able to meet up with professor face-to-face, -face. is that like the next best option? And kind of transitioning from that into the importance of physical presence, of not just face-to-face, -face, but person-to-person -person education, and um, how that plays in comparison to just strictly virtual email, um, just online text education. No, that's a, 
Those are good questions. Um, I mean, let's, let's this is why I find Heidegger helpful. Technology is intrinsically a holding of things in reserve. Uh, and it's a taking of reality out of the flow of, uh, 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 of being. And that's true for telephones where we talk to each other right, right away. And it's also true of Skype. Uh, I mean, you know, there's a, my image is being uploaded and sent. Um, and so it's being held in reserve. And then, and then and we will that it gets transmitted right away. Uh, but it could just as well have been taped, like my lecture is now being taped, to be, to be, uh, for, to, for people to come and look at me face to face um, later on. So, uh, but the fact that we can take it out and then, and then manipulate it as we wish creates a different f uh, phenomenology of our, of our interaction with it. Um, you know, you can hang up uh, when you get angry as I have, slam the receiver down on the phone. Um, or, I, or as we now have cell phones, people call us and we look at the phone number and we say, I, I don't really want to talk to him right now. And you just let the thing ring. And when you're on Skype talking to your professor, uh, you know, and you're looking at that screen and everything, all those things, well, what's going on around you? You know, um, uh, you, know you could, uh, you're, you're Skyping, but your friend is visiting, and you go, you go oh, geez, I gotta, that's, oh, oh no, oh, ha, ha. I, gotta, I gotta go with Skype. And your friend is sitting, drinking coffee on the couch while you're, while you're talking to the professor, and she's going <laughs> at various things and trying to, trying to crack you up and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so this, these are possibilities. It, these are also possibilities in the classroom. You're sitting next to someone who's passing you notes. So it's not like this is unknown to us in the classroom. It's just that the, 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 the power of physical presence exercises, uh, um, it's a form of our, our native human sociality makes us vulnerable to people's personal presence in a way that technology uh, uh, diminishes. It's of its nature, technology diminishes it because it is a taking out of things. It's a taking of things out of the stream uh, that's, that's why it's so good. That's why it's so powerful. That's why it's so useful. Um, so I would say that uh, well, something like Skype or telephone contact, I mean, it's a blessing to be able to call people on a telephone that you would not otherwise be able to make personal contact with. It's a blessing to be able to Skype uh, with the professor if you are, you know, if the part of the course was to go to do some archeological dig, right, with um, some multiple university group, they all went, and you had, a, a, you had periods where you're Skyping with the professor. This is great. This is a, a way that technology can enhance, just like be able to put articles um, you know, in PDF form and distribute to your students can be a facilitate the transmission of information. Uh, but we just have to be clear that it's not the same thing. It's, it's, a, it's an enhancement. It's a development. Uh, it's a continuation of something that's really only, only I think, gets its fullest uh, form in the personal face-to-face -face encounter. We're nearly out of time, but I wanted to encourage especially any student who might be sitting back there with a question to come forward. Could you elaborate on what you view is the relationship between higher education and other social institutions in, in the formation of individuals? Yeah, um, that, that's, that's helpful, because one of the things I wanted to get in my talk is that uh, in, the, in the Catholic code of canon law, so church is clearly a very powerful uh, soul-shaping institution. And in the code of canon law, uh, it's not permissible for the bishop to exercise his sacramental duties by telephone. So he can't ordain by telephone and he can't. Now the code didn't envision Skype, or, or, uh, but he can't by, you cannot, you know, you cannot, uh, uh, you know, he can't baptize by telephone or, or ordain by telephone or, 
You can't hear confessions by telephone, which is more, maybe more fitting because there's no actual action. There's no physical interaction in, in sacramental confession. But you cannot, you cannot um, give absolution on a telephone. Uh, so that, that tells you something about what the intuitions are of the, the Catholic Church about the relationship between information technology and the soul forming work of the church. Uh, I think it's kind of problematic that in a lot of Protestantism, people think watching uh, religious services on screens is equal to attending church. Um, so you know, you're in your living room and you watch, uh, you watch a worship, worship service. In Catholicism, it's not possible because you have to receive communion. Um, so there's a physical action. But I think this is probably very problematic. I mean, I think a lot of people recognize there's something wrong here. Um, about this, because it is the same thing. Why is it important to be physically in church? Because you have to deal with the people, right, face to face. It. So I want to go back to a notion that I have. The most important people are the people we can't avoid. The most important people are the people we can't avoid. When we're baptized uh, into a church, into the fellowship, of, into the body of Christ, we can't avoid. St. Paul tells us that we're, we cannot avoid the people who we uh, enter into that fellowship with, for good and for ill. They're going to they're gonna afflict us. They're going to help us. We've got to deal with all those aspects of it. And I think the classroom is, is of uh, marriage is another social institution that has that. So I would say the most important institutions for forming us are the institutions that, we ca that are very difficult to get out of. In other words, the relationships that are different to get out of. Uh, again, church, family, and again, I think it's not an accident, educational institutions, the classroom, these establish bonds that transcend the student's anxiety about his, his or her grade. And they create these relationships that are, are very, um, they're, not, they're not nearly as strong as the relationships of family, but they're not commercial relationships, they're not optional relationships. And students feel that acutely, which is why students are very vulnerable to the opinions their teachers have of them. Conversely, teachers have it too, which is why teachers don't like to go to rate, ratemyprofessor.com. It's very painful to read the snarky comments that your students write about you, because you're giving yourself, right? And the conversely, the students are, you're writing papers, you're expressing your opinions, you're exposing yourself, and and this is a, this is this these create bonds that are uh, that make it that make it hard for us to avoid each other. Um, anyway, I hope that was helpful. Okay. Please join me in thanking God. Thank you. Thank you.